Uh, so I will be talking about a method um, to reconstruct uh, spatial representations from fMRI data, uh, in particular spatial working memory representations, uh, and then present an, uh, a type of neural model that we have used to account for certain aspects or certain findings uh, in uh, these reconstructions. Uh, I should mention uh, ahead, as uh, Johan already pointed out, that I'm not really an fMRI researcher. Um, so all the fMRI data and this reconstruction method I'll talk about is from the lab of John Sturensis. Uh, uh, I only did the, uh, this neural model to explain some of this data. So some uh, minimum background on working memory. So working memory is a high precision but uh, limited capacity storage um, mechanism over short durations. Um, it's typically associated with sustained neural activity, uh, meaning that there are uh, neurons that uh, in working memory tasks um, start firing uh, when a cue is presented. Uh, maintain this elevated firing rate during a delay period without any uh, stimulus being present and then return to a baseline activation after a response has been made. Um, there are believed to be separate uh, stores or separate such mechanisms for visual and auditory or ver verbal working memory and I'll be focusing on the visual part and visual working memory is tested behaviorally in humans uh, often with uh, this kind of uh, cute recall task. Uh, where subjects are presented with a sample array for a brief time, then there's a delay of a few seconds, and then they have to report uh, the feature of one item from the sample array, so in this case the color at the cube location uh, on a continuous scale, like here, a color wheel. And in a recent fMRI study, um, Sprague, Esther, and Serensis have, uh, have used this kind of task uh, to kind of illuminate the mechanisms uh, of uh, working memory. Um, in their version, it was, a, it was a, a spatial working memory task um, with a retrospective queue in some trials. Um, so the task looked like this. In uh, all cases, the subject had to remember the locations of uh, two stimuli, two color disks, always one red, one blue. And after a total delay of 16 seconds, they had to report the location of one of these disks, uh, indicated by a change in the color of the fixation point, um, and they had to just adjust the, the horizontal or vertical bar to report that location of the blue item. Um, in all trials, for the first half of that delay period, uh, they had to uh, keep both items in memory, indicated by this uh, purple cue that it could be either the red or the blue item being tested. But in some trials, at the, in the second half of the uh, delay, um, a cue already indicated which item was going to be tested, so they had to only retain that in memory and could forget the other one. Uh, now, and it is known that this kind of uh, cue, even given after the uh, sample area is already gone, uh, improves memory for the queued item at the cost for the uncued items. Um, now the authors applied uh, what they called an um, inverse encoding model to reconstruct um, the <coughs> spatial working memory representations during this task from the fMRI data and uh, they claimed that uh, their results provide evidence uh, for kind of activity silent working memory that is a working memory state that does not uh, rely on the sustained uh, firing activity. Um, the decoding method they used uh, looked like this. They employed an additional uh, mapping task um, in which subjects simply had to attend uh, to a, a kind of salient visual stimulus presented at different locations on the screen. Um, and they uh, defined a set of uh, what they call spatial channels, um, each of them reflecting one location in visual space and associated with a spatial filter, which is just a Gaussian-like uh, kind of pattern. Um, and they uh, determined the expected cha spatial channel responses in each trial uh, in this mapping task um, by simply uh, computing the dot product of the spatial filter uh, with the area of the mapping stimulus. They also recorded the fMRI data, so they got a lot of uh, uh, bold signals, uh, which were z-scored uh, for many voxels, and then they uh, determined a weight matrix uh, such that it um, kind of uh, optimally explained the uh, activation in each voxel as a linear combination of these expected channel responses, uh, which can be done through linear regression. Um, and so this weight matrix is computed over all trials so that it should compute uh, really the uh, kind of contributions of each channel uh, to the voxel responses across all possible seamless locations. Um, you can then use uh, the inverted weight matrix um, to kind of reconstruct the spatial uh, channels uh, from a single trial in the working memory task. Uh, so a single trial and a single point in time. You get the bold signals, uh, com uh, uh, multiply them simply with the inverted weight matrix and get the channel responses. And you can then uh, obtain a kind of a continuous spatial reconstruction of 
kind of what is what the subject has in working memory or what is he is attending to um, by uh, multiplying these channel responses with the spatial filters, uh, where you can, as an additional little trick, um, align different uh, locations in the task, uh, so the different uh, locations of the target stimuli uh, to obtain a single construction or multiple trials by simply rotating all those spatial filters. So you can align multiple trials to each other. And doing that, um, they get uh, pretty nice results, uh, showing that this method uh, seems to work to construct the spatial representations. Um, so in this uh, trial with a neutral queue, um, you see that after a brief delay, after the uh, sample stimuli uh, come on, um, you see two bumps of activation in this reconstruction, uh, reflecting the location of these two stimuli, uh, which um, then uh, decrease in intensity over the duration of the retention interval. And uh, in particular, in the uh, trial with you know, in the trials with a valid queue, um, again with a brief delay after this queue is given, uh, the uh, kind of activation in this reconstruction for the queued item increases again, uh, whereas the um, uh, activation for the non queued item uh, disappears. Uh, these authors, additionally, uh, to quantify this a bit more, um, also proposed a uh, kind of scalar measure of the reconstruction fidelity um, by taking activation from an annulus in this uh, 2D reconstruction and multiplying that with a cosine function centered on the target location in each trial. And they showed this way that uh, the fidelity uh, in the task for the neutral queue remains above chance for the target location uh, throughout the retention interval. And you also see uh, this uh, uh, <coughs> clear restoration of the, this fidelity measure after the retro queue is given. So that's this uh, reconstruction method. Um, and we then uh, applied a new model to try to explain that and uh, to explain this data. Um, and uh, to motivate that a little bit, uh, I'll give you the interpretation of uh, these original authors for their findings. They said if there is sustained spiking activity in active working memory and that is degraded during the detention retention interval, then the working memory representation should be permanently impaired. But they saw that the spatially unspecific retro queue, so this color queue given after half the delay period, uh, restores the fidelity of the degraded representation indicating that there must be some activity silent representation there that is not visible in the fMRI signal, so therefore not visible in the, in the reconstruction, but that can be reactivated by an uh, informative, but uh, spatially unspecific queue. Now our criticism and the criticism of some other peoples for that uh, is that this reconstruction does on the one hand take not take into account the binding information that is needed to perform the task, so the kind of uh, conjunction between color and spatial information, uh, and their uh, interpretation ignores new dynamics which can increase the reconstruction fidelity without actually adding spatial information. And our approach to make this uh, criticism a bit more concrete was to uh, design a neural network model that reproduces the experimental results uh, based <coughs> only on sustained activity uh, for working memory states. Um, the kind of model we used is a dynamic neural field model, uh, sometimes also called an attractor network or a continuous attractor network. Um, it is generally based on the concept of neural population codes, meaning that uh, to represent um, continuous uh, value stimuli, such as the stimulus location in this task, you have a, a population of neurons whose tuning curves uh, cover the uh, underlying feature space. And if a specific value is then presented as a stimulus, um, you get a distribution of activation, so a lot of neurons are activated to uh, different degrees, and you get um, a new representation as a population code, something like this. Um, the uh, dynamic field model somewhat abstracts from the individual neurons uh, in this population and simply describes this as an activation, uh, kind of a, a neural activation distribution over the feature space. And um, if we have a, as a feature space a two-dimensional visual space, uh, you can imagine that something like this. So here's the activation distribution reflecting a single stimulus value, so a single location uh, by an activation bump over the two-dimensional space. And the dynamic neural field model now um, is a uh, kind of a continuous time recurrent neural network that employs this kind of representation, um, which is typically characterized by strong lateral interactions of the kind of canonical form uh, that you have um, short range uh, excitation, uh, typically described by a Gaussian interaction function, and long range inhibition. So that uh, points uh, close to each other in this field um, activate each other when they are, when one point is actually itself uh, and inhibits uh, further more distant points. 
Um, the model can be formally described as a set of differential equations, so for a single, single field, a single equation that describes the rate of change in activation at each point as a function of the current activation states, inputs, and lateral interactions. Uh, in particular, the uh, change in activation at one point is here described um, by these first two terms uh, by the negative activation plus the resting level, so activation is always kind of driven towards a fixed resting level. Um, there can be external input which uh, locally increases activation in this uh, population code or this neural field. And uh, this final or this uh, next term here describes the interaction effects as a convolution of an interaction function or a weight matrix basically uh, with a nonlinear output function of the activation in the field. And finally, there's typically a noise term which does uh, produces some random fluctuation in the activation state. Um, now, we wanted to uh, define kind of a, a minimal neural architecture that uh, explains the performance in this task and um, can be used to explain this fMRI data. Um, so to perform the task, uh, the new the system, um, well, okay. first of all, we use a kind of combined um, perceptual and working memory representation to keep it as simple as possible. Um, and the uh, model needs to represent the locations of the stimuli, but also the colors that uh, go with each location. So we use the kind of simple uh, uh, conjunctive coding with uh, two uh, separate fields, uh, one for uh, the red stimuli, one for the blue stimuli over the two-dimensional visual space. And you can think of that as basically two slices over a more complete uh, conjunctive code of color and location. Um, the interactions or um, the inputs uh, to this model architecture are simply um, localized inputs for the stimuli that are presented. So these uh, color disks that are to be memorized simply produce a localized input for the location and the color that they have. And the uh, color cues that are given by the change of the uh, fixation point color are modeled as uh, global inputs to the uh, corresponding, uh, or to the field with the corresponding color, which simply uh, globally raise activation within this field. And there are this kind of uh, lateral interactions within the field, such that um, there's a strong uh, self-excitation or local or, uh, excitation uh, over short distances and uh, inhibition over longer distances. Uh, inhibition acts both uh, within a field um, globally and uh, between fields. So the strong activation in one field uh, leads to stronger inhibition of the other field. Um, now uh, we simulated this model um, by uh, creating activation time courses uh, by numerical integration of the field equation. Um, and we took just exactly the, or tried to model, modulate, uh, model as precisely as possible the uh, stimulus timings and properties from the original behavioral experiment. And that then looks something like this. Uh, that initially there's just kind of random noise in these activation fields. Then when the stimuli are presented, there's strong activation for the corresponding stimulus locations in either field. Um, over the delay period now, uh, sorry. So when the stimuli disappear over the delay period, um, you see that there's still a much weaker activation uh, bump uh, remaining in each field, uh, which is uh, sustained by self-excitation in the field, so by these lateral interactions that is strong enough to maintain uh, this uh, localized activation even after the stimulus is turned off. Um, now when the uh, color cue is given for one of the items, um, that field is globally activated and you see there's in particular a stronger activation of this uh, already present activation peak. And um, since that is becomes more active, the other field is more strongly inhibited, uh, leading to the extinction of the uh, persistent activation peak there because um, the uh, self-excitation is no longer sufficient to overcome this strong inhibition and uh, the activation peak collapses. Uh, finally, at the time of the response, uh, the uh, field with a target item is queued again, and at the end, the uh, kind of uh, position response can be re read out from the field um, as the center of mass of the remaining activation peak. Uh, now, this shows again this um, uh, model activation in sna snapshots over the uh, time course of the experiment um, for the for trial with a retro queue given after half the delay period and the same thing for trial without retro queue, 
uh, where the uh, simply both uh, locations are maintained over the whole delay period and only at the end one of them is queued and the other one is suppressed. Um, now, you can probably already kind of see that uh, some of these features uh, are quite similar to these, or at least qualitatively similar to these reconstructions, to the spatial reconstructions um, from the fMRI data, uh, but they are quantitatively, quantitatively still quite different um, since we don't take into account any of these effects of uh, the fMRI signal uh, creation. And in particular, we also still have these two separate fields uh, for the uh, two uh, stimuli. So what we did is we generated uh, simulated uh, bolt signals from the uh, neural model activation patterns by um, simply uh, uh, modeling each voxel as uh, uh, the sum of uh, the activations at a random at a collection of random selected points. Um, we assume that there's some uh, kind of random topic organization here, so that uh, the points for each voxel are uh, kind of somewhat centered around one spatial location, but taken randomly from either field. We then uh, temporarily uh, filter these um, voxel activations uh, by the uh, canonical hemodynamic response function. And when then we apply the exact same inverse encoding model that uh, Sprague Esther and Serensis uh, employed uh, for their fMRI data. And with that, we can quite nicely uh, reproduce um, these patterns. So here's again the experimental data. And here are the simulation results after applying this uh, decoding model and we will produce these appearing of the uh, activation bumps after a brief delay after the uh, stimulus presentation. And in particular also here, um, we reproduce this strengthening of the um, kind of uh, location for the acute item um, and the disappearance of the other item. Um, same thing also shown here in this for the scalar measure of fidelity. We produce this uh, time process, and in particular here this restoration of fidelity after the retro cue is given. Um, I think I have to skip over this part and uh, just uh, I'm going to mention one more thing. Um, the model is a functional model, so it can also uh, explain behavior. As I said, um, we can uh, read out the uh, position information in the end, <coughs> kind of the position uh, response um, from the location of the remaining activation peak. And uh, errors in the model, so errors in the position response arise due to random drift in these activation peaks, which are sustained only by the self excitation. Uh, and in some cases, collapse of activation peaks due to random noise. Um, we found a higher error with uh, the neutral queue due to inhibitory interactions between these uh, two memory items, um, so between these two activation peaks in the fields, um, which is consistent with the behavioral results, which also found the higher error rates in the uh, neutral queue condition. Um, and there's actually another condition that I didn't mention with just a single item, which has in both cases the lowest error rates. and um, also, I want to mention here that uh, the retro queue does not, as the original authors uh, suggested, improve the precision of a queued item once it is already decayed. It simply uh, protects uh, the activation for that queued item from further decay, and that is sufficient to explain the behavioral data. Um, yeah, to conclude, I've uh, presented this inverse encoding model um, to reconstruct spatial representations um, over the space from fMRI data which does not explicitly rely on this data being uh, retinotopically organized or something like that, uh, since it uses this uh, weight matrix computation. Um, and I've then presented a dynamic neural field model, which explains the reconstructed activation patterns. It is a process model, which I think makes it kind of uh, useful in this uh, context. So a model that generates continuous time courses of activation um, and employs a format of presentation that is compatible with these reconstructions based on simple uh, neural population codes. Uh, it is a functional model that uh, also can reproduce behavioral results. And we can have demonstrated with this kind of model that um, it is not necessary to uh, propose an activity silent working memory state to explain these restoration of uh, fMRI activity or of, of uh, uh, reconstruction activity. Um, it is simply, can simply explain as an effect of neural dynamics uh, in such a model. Um, so we cannot, of course, with the model uh, say which mechanism really occurs but we can demonstrate that uh, kind of standard mechanisms that have been proposed for working memory based on the sustained activation are sufficient to explain the results in the study. One last thing, uh, if anyone here is interested in uh, using this kind of dynamic field models, uh, there's a website, um, dynamicfieldtheory.org, uh, 
uh, from my, uh, well, from the group that I did my PhD with in Bochum and their collaborators with papers, lectures, and software and events on dynamic neural fields. And uh, there you also find um, a MATLAB toolbox called Cosivina, which I have used here to perform these simulations, um, which allows you to uh, create such neural field models and simulate them relatively easily. Uh, yeah, I want to thank my supervisor for base and um, our funding source, the Wellcome Trust, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.